Good day. Hi, this is Russell Hendrickson. I'm the CEO at Practical Data Solutions. Thank you for joining us. Joining me today for today's webinar is Scott Everett. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Patient access, obviously, is a very critical piece of the revenue cycle. It impacts everything ranging from how we get our patients into the clinic all the way down to a registration, check-in, making sure all of the insurance information is verified so that we don't get denials on the back end. Everything's authorized. We're doing point-of-service collections. Patient satisfaction is the, the biggest thing that we want to worry about because all of the things that we just mentioned and all of these things that pertain to the revenue cycle are really part of the entire patient experience. And when you think about patient access, that is really the first impression that the patients have of your organization. If you really dig down to what gives the patient the overall experience or picture of your organization, poor patient access experience, you could give them the best care in the world and they're going to have some sort of negative feeling towards, towards your organization. So it's really critical that, that we can manage their perceptions of, of what we're doing that way. And really, patient access is a highly competitive part of, of what we're trying to do. Just a little more than half of patients that were surveyed recently said that loyalty to the provider is what's important when they're trying to receive their care. Really, cost and how quickly they can get in are the most important factors to, to what they want. And if you don't want to make your patient access good, well, there's a whole lot of options out there that will. You know, I, I can only speak to my own experience here, Scott. Several years ago, I'm in a very small town, but an urgent care center opened up nights, weekends, Saturdays, Sundays. And, you know, there have been times where when I was really sick or I really felt I wanted to be seen right away, my primary care physician, who's not even a half a mile away, they couldn't get me in or they said, oh, we can't get you in today. I went down to the urgent care center. I don't like to do it, but it's a perfect example of when I really wanted to be seen if I'd had to go to another town or go drive 20, 30 minutes, I probably wouldn't have done it. The fact that it's just literally another minute down the main street here in town is, is giving me options when I really feel I need to be seen. And I think that's reflective of what you're seeing with, with patients today. So with that, today's topic, we're talking about patient access, we're talking about patient experience, but the question is why visualize data, right? What is this visualization term? I've been doing this a long time. You know, it used to be dashboards. Everybody would talk about dashboards. But visualization is you know, the ability to communicate through pictures, to make it easy to understand, and then also to be able to monitor or support change. And so let's take a, a look at a quick visualization here. And what you're looking at on the screen here is uh, Tableau, one of the most popular visualization tools, and we'll talk more about the tools. And this is an example where we have an interactive visualization. We might want to be measuring today, you know, what's the change in utilization from what happened in the first quarter of the year to what's happening right now in the second quarter and how much utilization's changed, right? And so very quickly, if your visualization's built correctly, we can interact with the data and we can see where we may have now be seeing less patients potentially because we've had to prioritize or triage. Maybe we're doing more telehealth or medicine. There could even be a positive impact on revenue, but the tools make it very easy to sort of point and click and drag and drop to understand what's going on. And we're gonna talk further about what you're seeing on the screen here as we start to break down different types of visualizations and then how do we apply them to patient access, et cetera. So I mentioned Tableau. We just saw a quick example of that, but what we see in healthcare, we only work with healthcare organizations, is typically one of these six packages being probably the most prevalent. Certainly the, the largest of the different companies that offer visualization packages tied to analytics. Packages like Tableau, Microsoft has Power BI, but of course there's also Excel, we'll talk about that today. MicroStrategy, one of the other big three independents along with Click. IBM has several different tools that fall into that category as well as business objects. And so with that, I think uh, we have a poll here, Scott, I wanna bring up and invite you to click on your screen and ask the question, what tools are you using? Looks like we've got some that are working in uh, in MicroStrategy, some that are working in, in others, maybe than IBM Cognos or uh, SAP Business Objects or something like that, and then uh, some that are working in Excel or Power BI. So um, that's that's good. We're going to show a lot of the dashboards or visualizations that, that can be done in several of these different tools. A lot of the tool functionality is very similar when you really dig into it, but what we want to get into now is Let's look at uh, kind of how these visualization tools can help you 
manage patient access within your organization. So what you're looking at on the screen here is this is another visualization through Tableau. Let's dig down a little deeper. So we're looking at things like appointment count, day of the week session. We've got bumped rates. We've got sort of breakdown of arrived versus bumped and canceled, some third next available, some booked, and then some more details around that. Scott, we built a visualization here. What does this say? What, what are you seeing here? What's really great about this is you have some pretty basic patient access metrics that we're looking here, but because it's in a visualized format, I can look and just digest immediately and say, I've got three providers that are struggling with their bump rates, or they're a lot higher than what I would anticipate seeing. And so I really want to dig in and investigate what's going on with those bump rates. In addition to that, I can look at maybe some demand by my session counts, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and how that works. One thing that really stands out to me is the variability in the third next availables that you're seeing right there. And what's interesting about that is third next available is a system generated metric, meaning it's what could happen based upon a particular point in time. And I wouldn't expect to see that much variability, which usually means that there's something going on within our processes or within the system itself that is kind of sabotaging the reporting. And so that's something we want to look into and something that we always recommend when we work with clients is to really dig in and understand what is it that we're doing to sabotage these numbers so that we can really get to highly accurate numbers and be able to manage to those. As I mentioned, there's multiple tabs here down on the bottom of the screen. If we click to the next page, we've added some target capacity of what we feel our organization can, can hold here. We've also blended in then patient satisfaction data so we can start to see how the providers are scoring on patient satisfaction as we correlate that. We also have visit types and some lag category breakdowns of the time it's taking to be seen. And when I dig into something like this, Russ, it, it's really interesting to, to look back at those third next available numbers and try to correlate them to the um, average lags. Average lag is a huge patient access metric that's the difference between the day the appointment's made and the day of the appointment itself. And, and when I dig into it, it's a what did happen. And, you know, you look at that and sometimes you look at like return patient visits or follow-ups and those can be artificially high just based upon how, you know, come back in 90 days, come back in a year if it's a physical, things like that. So I may want to dig in more to like new patient visits because those are ones where I want to get them in pretty much as quickly as possible, but don't necessarily have an emergency attached to it. So if I filter on that, then I can look at maybe my average lag category breakdowns and really understand that there may be still an unacceptable number of the, the greater than 30-day numbers that are there, but at least it's going to look a little bit better than when I'm looking at all visit types that may be artificially inflated for one reason or another. Some good points there. As we continue through this dashboard, you'll notice this next tab is called Opportunities. And this is a, one of the charts that we started with when we, were, we started the webinar here, where we're actually doing a utilization comparison of Q1 versus Q2. And what's unique about this is we're then correlating and predicting because we know we've not seen as many patients. These physicians are less productive. We can actually then correlate and highlight how much revenue estimated was lost based on that utilization change that was negative, which potentially on the other side, we could look and see what is the upside because we increased the number of visits, we're extrapolating or predicting what the potential opportunity is. Now, this is useful information when things are very consistent, but when you think about what's going on today, right, where we have, you know, our utilization has changed dramatically, potentially doing more telehealth or phone consultations, we may be limited to doing any kind of screening or care procedures. So being able to flexibly understand what's changing and what's the impact, and then being able to understand the potential loss coming, because we may not have even started getting paid on the services we're not doing, or the potential uptick because our business has shifted in such a way and with some of the new Medicare uh, RVU incentives, right, we may be able to better predict. So obviously, you know, going back to where Scott started, what we're seeing in patient access ultimately will drive down to revenue, right? So being able to look at sort of all those pieces, but simple visualizations that communicate, here's where we're seeing less visits, patients, Here's where we're seeing more and then being able to sort of extrapolate that opportunity, making it very easy to understand what's going on. And that's the point of a good visualization, making it easy to see. 
What we want to do is ask, how do, how do you guys feel you're doing regarding your organizational usage um, around patient access reporting? Are, do you think you're really strong or outstanding in what you do? Do you have some gaps that you're doing okay? Or is it something that you're pretty much struggling with? Okay. Looks like about a third of you rating strong or outstanding, which is good. A couple are saying that, that it's really limited. And the fact of the matter is some of these metrics are a little difficult to, to get to depending upon the, the system that you're utilizing. This is good to know. So thank you for voting in on this. So this is a, a visualization that was kind of put together based upon the current environment out there where sometimes you may want to get a little bit more granular with what you're trying to do. And what this is is kind of a utilization at an hourly level. Um, and what's built in where typically maybe you want to look at most of this being scheduled type slots that are available, but you may need to, at this point in time, build in more for emergency type visits to get in. You may want to build in more for telehealth. And frankly, telehealth may become part of the, the new normal where you're building in more slots available for that. There's some efficiencies that are there I mean, if a lot of the reimbursement methodologies stay the same. And then sometimes you're, you're freezing some areas so that you can make sure that you have some availability to get in same-day type appointments or get some administrative or other type work available done as well. But this is just kind of another example of how the environment may change and you may need to get more granular in terms of what you're trying to do. So we're going to go through now sort of three different examples of some of the challenges you might be seeing in your organization. Obviously, some of these are somewhat contingent upon us having some kind of normalcy in our ability to treat patients. We, we may have to look forward when you think about some of these situations, but I think anybody as a practice administrator can certainly relate to the challenges or they've experienced these challenges before we went into the, the current situation. But a patient complaining about how long it takes to be seen, referring physicians calling up and saying, you know, my patient, I need them seen right away. The patient called, they can't get in in a reasonable amount of time. Patient satisfaction scores, so coming back as poor. This is a, a big one that organizations sometimes see, and it's sometimes challenging to break down and understand where the challenges are. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, you know, some of the other kind of challenges related to this, lots of cancellations or no-show appointments, lots of variability in volume. Obviously, that even may be the case today. Scott, where do we start when we're looking at something like this? How do, how do we begin to address timely access and making patients satisfied that they're getting seen quickly and able to come in? Yeah, so uh, whenever I work with a client when implementing a patient access, the first thing I want to look at, everything's about finding capacity. What is it that we can do and where is there some availability that we can find? So I start by looking at sessions. And I look and I see, okay, Monday mornings, we're doing this level. We know we can do that volume of patients because we are. So why aren't we doing that every day? Why aren't we doing that every session? Every area that you see in black is available capacity. We found capacity. It's there. Why is it not being filled when we're talking about patients not being able to get in? So this is where we start and we want to start digging a little from this point on um, and looking at what are the bottlenecks that are keeping us from getting that kind of ideal capacity. Sometimes it's our scheduling templates and what's in there and what's available. Sometimes we need to dig in and look at what's going on in the system, visit type duration, slot duration, blocks, things like that. All, all of those things can kind of lead to weird templates that, that our schedulers are seeing. Patients have a say in this as well. You may look at Friday afternoons and patients don't want to come in on a Friday afternoon. They want to come in on a Monday morning or Wednesday afternoon. And so trying to meet patient demand is something that has become highly competitive. You may have to work some odd hours in order to do that. And then really when we dig down, it's not so much what we do as much as it is what is it that the patients think we're doing. And that's really the key issue that we want to dig into. So given that background, there's several metrics or places you might start to look at. We talked a little bit about the session statistics, looking at morning afternoons, breaking things down for new patient visits, return visits. We've talked about scheduling lags a little bit, third next available, and of course where we might be booking time or forcing patients in outside the schedule. To me, one of the best metrics to look at always though when we talk about this is what's going on with patient satisfaction scores. And so most organizations doing surveys, um, there's, a, there's a number of different companies that do them. Unfortunately, the survey data, when it comes back, is fairly bland. It's a list of questions or it's a web analytics, so you've got to go in and pull down data into Excel. 
this is an example of a visualization built out by the PDS team here. And there's several things that I like about this. This is actually built out in Excel. For those on the line that are PDS customers, this can be automated using our tool PDS Dash. But what I like about this visualization is the two sort of key survey ratings, overall rating here, 91% for the physician. So we can very quickly, your focus goes to the 91. In the second area, your focus goes to would recommend a group, 65%. Well, that doesn't look very good. And we can then quickly glance down the survey topics. And you can see right over here, there's a little bar of yellow, communicating with practice on phone, ease of scheduling appointment, scheduling staff courteous. You know, maybe that's one particular location or practice. Maybe we have some training issues. You know, maybe we just don't have the capacity. And so the patients aren't feeling, you know, the staff may be trying to do everything right and the physician's schedules aren't open. But, you know, this kind of visual is making the data much more user-friendly to the audience is exactly what we're trying to do here is to make this data communicate quickly. This is great because, again, you can look at it and in a matter of seconds see problem areas or see things that need to be addressed. What I find interesting in this, and this really highlights the flexibility of Excel, is that we didn't set the benchmark for good, bad at 50th percentile. We set it at 75th. Nobody's striving to be average. Everybody's looking to be above average. And so being able to set your benchmark at, at this level really kind of helps to move the organization in, in the right direction when they're seeing the indicators below where they want to be, not at the midpoint of what's there. I think another type of visualization that, that you can look at that's good is this is something that maybe you could put in the hands of providers. And, and again, this is built out in Excel and using some of the visualization techniques that are available within Excel are great because you can get things up and running very quickly and very easily and there's a lot of flexibility to it. Looking at something like this, this is something that as a provider I could look at and I know right away I can see green, yellow, red. I'm doing well in these areas. I'm struggling in this particular area. I can digest this immediately and not have to spend a lot of time digesting numbers. I know exactly where my focus needs to be. And this gives a good indication of just a, a handful of key indicators that really should be driving the patient access um, and what the provider needs to know in order to be able to manage it himself. Excellent, Scott. So let's take a look at a web-based visualization. This happens to be built out in MicroStrategy. It's similar to the one that we looked at in, in Tableau. In this visualization, we purposely featured the scheduling utilization of the physicians, including where is 100% of booked versus available time. So you could see here we have this physician as an outlier, probably forcing patients in or double booking. And in other cases, then we can even see where that lower 60% utilized in the schedule. And, you know, maybe we have some new physicians that aren't performing, or maybe we have some patients that just don't want to continue to see physicians based on poor performance. We've blended in third next available. Here's that scheduling appointment lag. And then, you know, a little bit of a cross tag, everything interactive, drillable, slice and dice. So, Scott, what jumps out at you here that you would want to highlight or you'd want to notice and have a practice administrator notice? Yeah, so I think more than most other areas of the revenue cycle, scheduling or patient access metrics really are most useful when they're correlated one against each other. And so one of the things that sticks out to me immediately is looking at the third next available which look to be in about the 20 or below range, yet we have by far, if I look at my appointment lags, by far the most are in that 30 plus day range. And so I really want to dig in and try to understand what is it that's going on. Now, again, it could be based upon visit types, and we may want to look at new or return visits and just schedule down at that new to, to see what's there. At the same time, we really want to make sure we're getting our new patients in as quickly as possible because they're not going to be return patients if we're not. So being able to dig in and correlate these numbers and really try to understand, um, is it a utilization issue, is it a templating issue, or is it a patient demand issue, something needs to be corrected, and, and this gives us a good indication of where to start. So moving through our second example really ties into where you left off there, Scott, which is our schedules are full. Our physicians are busy. We're seeing lots of patients. So we know we're, we're seeing patients, we're getting them in, but we're not performing, we're not collecting revenue, we're not hitting any of the benchmarks for RVUs, or we're so full of capacity we can't seem to add new patients, which is a problem. Or we've got patients, but the patients are waiting, 
physicians are running behind regularly. So these are typical problems that might be related more to volume and efficiency than access. So let's dig into that a little bit. Scott, where do you like to start to address that as a challenge within an organization? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things that, that dig into this, and, and this is something that providers are actually a lot of times very interested in because they're sometimes patient access metrics are being thrown into their compensation plans. But a lot of times what is driving their productivity can be access issues, looking at things like lost appointment rates. And it's not just no-shows, but also same-day cancellations where it does fill up the schedule, but we're not seeing a patient and a lot of times we're not backfilling that appointment. We maybe want to look at their patient panels, the amount of new patient growth or the, the clinical fingerprint that, that we're seeing. Are our referring physicians who have full schedules, are they taking on a primary care role or are they referring back to their primary care providers when they're uh, they're not necessarily dealing with that particular specialty. Or again, looking at maybe some predictive performance opportunities and comparing the providers one against each other to kind of model out the behavior. Yeah, and that really leads into the next couple examples that we're going to show here. This is a what we call a static dashboard in Excel. And it was built by one of the executive consultants that's worked with our organization for a long time. But it's really bringing in either whether they're external benchmarks or internal targets, right? And so it's easy to put a line through a graph. But what is often missed sometimes is when you, if you look over here on third next available, a lot of times the audience doesn't understand that good performance is below the line, right? So we're looking at same day appointments, right? We're saying good is up. But if you look at no show right here, you know, just by adding that indicator, good performance is down. We should be below the line, not above the line gives you some nice context to both the data that you're looking at. If we really want to blend in external benchmark data, this is another visualization that we built out in Excel. It can be automated to bring in your data and refresh your data, making it easy to publish. You really can't miss. Here's the industry benchmark. Here might be our organization goal. Here's then our actual performance against those metrics. And then very simple red X green check. You really can't miss how we're performing as an organization. There's more red X's than green checks to what is considered good performance in our industry and then even what our goal or internal targets are. So it makes it very easy to do comparison points to metrics, be it patient access or anything else. So a fairly simple visualization that can be used organization-wide. Are we hitting our goals? Are we really delivering where we want to be on these metrics? Benchmarks are really good for um, organizations that really want to kind of move to that next level and comparing to best practices, determining where they want to be. Um, I would caution that for organizations that maybe want to start incorporating external benchmarks, just a few things to be careful of is that um, a lot of times the calculations may be a little bit different with what they're doing compared to how you're measuring things. So you want to make sure that, that you're matching and comparing apples to apples when that happens. Um, another thing is that when you are using these benchmarks, it's really important to not utilize them in kind of punitive or embarrassing fashion. The way we like to refer to it at PDS is we generate light, not heat. What we're really trying to do is shed light on opportunities that, that exist for improvement and where the organization really can get to um, in order to be that highest performing organization that every one of us uh, desires to get to that point. So here's another visualization where a number of things obviously lead into a provider's productivity based upon number of visits that are seen, coding percentage, uh, lags, things like that. All, all can really factor into that percentage. And this is something that, again, is digested very quickly at a medical director or clinic manager level that they can look and see which of my providers are struggling, which of my providers are performing well. Red, yellow, green, um, the, the colors are there that, that you can really dig in and, and see how is everybody doing and where are the areas that I need to focus on as a manager. One of the things that I like about this visualization in particular is if you notice the metrics here on the right that Scott highlighted, here's your performance RVUs. We've got the tiers right at the top. So if we want to just filter out by benchmark. But in addition, right down the bottom here, you can see these little bar charts and they look like sort of regular red, yellow, green distributions. But if I want to see all the physicians who aren't turning in their charges quickly, I can literally just click on that lag. The red lag, the interactive visual is also a filter. So right away, we're now seeing all the physicians 
with not turning in their charges quickly. And then we could come right up to RVUs and say, well, let's look at everybody who's well below the benchmark right away. So this interactive visualization just literally narrowed down who are the physicians, where we've got opportunities. These physicians, if they could just turn in their charges quicker, we'd be able to boost their RVUs. And you can quickly see which uh, division they're in, but it looks like across the board, other than maybe infectious disease, we have quite a few physicians that aren't performing, in, at least in our demo data set. So you know, the visualization is not only telling the story, but it's also making it very easy for the user to interact with the data to quickly highlight the outliers and give you the opportunity in the area to focus on. And with that, Scott, I think I've got one more that's very much a focus type dashboard looking at both internal and external benchmarks. Do you want to walk us through this one? Yeah, this particular dashboard is less a visualization as it is a, a dashboard, but this is what we refer to as performance opportunity dashboarding. And this is something that we utilize across multiple different areas of the revenue cycle. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to compare what is happening to what could happen. And we're trying to use some predictive modeling in order to get there. So in this particular case, we're looking at clinic visits. And you can see right away the, the activity of each provider with the amount of collections they have, the, the total clinic visits they have. You can calculate an average outpatient revenue per visit very easily. Um, and then we can just look at what are the number of blocked sessions that each provider has. Well, once we have that information, we can compare the providers to an internal benchmark just against each other. You know, how, how many visits are the division doing and how is each provider comparing to the division? And the great thing about the average is always you're going to have half that are below that average. So um, there's an opportunity for them to, to reach up to that. In addition to that, we maybe have an internal target or an external benchmark of where we want to get to. And so when we take that out, we can then model it and say, hey, if this provider was performing at the average level of the department, there would be an opportunity for additional revenue that would come across in the amount of, in Charles Anderson's case, $22,000, or if we're looking at Leon Joplin, almost $70,000. If they were just performing at the same level of their peers in terms of the number of visits per session that they're scheduling. Now, maybe they're a little bit different. That's fine. We can also compare out what if they were at that benchmark level or what if they were at that average revenue per visit and understanding how the way that they're doing things is really kind of leading to a cost of doing business, so to speak. One of the great things about this is it definitely highlights opportunities. It looks at it from a, a financial standpoint, but it's showing you the three or four highest opportunity providers that you can work with. And this can be a fairly compelling dashboard for change in the way that they do things because it's showing it in a in more of a monetary sense of here's what it's costing you to do things this way. Let's see if we can work to correct it. And it's going to benefit both the provider and the organization when that occurs. This is more of a dashboard. I mean, it is visual in that you can kind of see and we're predicting but this technique is fairly easy to do in Excel. Again, if you're a PDS customer, these templates are available to you, and they can be automated in Dash. But even if you're not using any of our automation tools, this technique can work with any sets of metrics. If you're more operationally focused, you're less interested in the dollars here, you could modify this dashboard and just predict how many more patients could be seen, how many more visits could be seen, so if you if you didn't want to do it in terms of dollars, or, and certainly these are predictive, I wouldn't necessarily recommend showing this to a physician directly. There's a couple advanced metrics that I want to talk about here. And Scott, I know you're going to walk us through the next visual dashboard, but I want to explain just a little bit. Cycle times is something that is sometimes a little difficult to get the data out, but to be able to measure how long did the patient actually spend walking in the door. And I think you're going to see more and more of this metric becoming important because with the current pandemic situation, we want to minimize any extra contact time we need with the, with the patients and patients interacting or being near other patients. But in this case, we're measuring how long was the patient sitting in the waiting room, how long was the patient waiting for the physician in the exam room, and how long did it take before the the patient actually checked out. And so let's look at that visualization I'll put up on the screen here. Scott, could you walk us through this visualization, which can be a little overwhelming if you've never looked at this type of data, but take us through this if you would. Yeah, cycle times is actually interesting because it is a place where some of our clients have started finding available capacity. And what we're really looking at here is we're looking at and trying to correlate 
the reality versus the what's in the system. So looking at something like at Mike Allen, where he's spending 60 minutes with the patient or amount of time between the time he sees the patient and the patient checks out, it's about 67. If you look at the slot duration, though, um, over on the other graph, it's looking like he's scheduling about 53 minute slots in order to get to that point. So trying to match up the reality to that, is, this is something where maybe there's some available capacity if he changes the way he does the business just a little bit. On the other end, we can look at like Dewana Rodriguez, where what she's doing is she's only spending about 10 minutes with the patient. They're spending a little bit more time in the workup, maybe with the MAs or the nurses doing things like that. Maybe she's seeing more new patients where, where they have more time collecting the history or whatever. But the interesting thing is you look at that and then where she's spending about 10 minutes with the patient, yet the slot duration is scheduled for about 30. There's some definite capacity there where she could do almost three times the volume by bringing more patients in or changing the scheduling, the slot durations that, that she has in her templates. So this is just something that is a little bit new. Some of these metrics can be a little bit difficult to get to depending upon the system that you're using. Sometimes it's available just directly out of the system. Sometimes you got to get creative and looking at maybe time slots within the medical record or uh, sometimes some of our providers are even doing the stopwatch thing and collecting them manually. But this is definitely becoming more and more kind of a key patient access metric that more physician offices are, are utilizing to try to find some additional capacity. Yeah, and Scott, I know a lot of organizations in particular using the pre-screening or pre-check-in in the parking lot. So we probably need to modify our visualization here to include time spent in the parking lot being pre-screened, right, before you get in to see the physician and walked into the clinic, given some of what's going on today with some of that uh, pre-triage being done in the parking lots today. But hopefully we won't have to add that metric the next time we do this uh, presentation. Let's do another uh, survey. We've got one more poll. Yeah, one of the things we'd like to ask about is where are areas that maybe you're having some difficulty doing is it in the scheduling utilization, patient satisfaction, cycle time, appointment status, cancellations, bumps, things like that. Um, everybody's a little bit different, and so this, this really helps us kind of gauge where a lot of folks are struggling. All right. All right. Patient sat, yeah. <laughs> that, that, it's interesting. Patient satisfaction is where... Uh, most people are finding a difficulty getting getting that out. So um, that, that's really good to know. I know that's something that can be difficult to stage depending upon, again, the vendor that you're utilizing in order to capture that data. So with that, we have one more example to, just to share, just a couple more examples of this. But what about value-based care and patient access, right? So many organizations, you know, more and more focused on being an ACO or taking advantage of some of the Medicare programs. You know, how do we start managing proactive well care for patients and, and treating HCCs? You know, how do we make sure we're reaching out for wellness visits if we're trying to take advantage of that Medicare program? Many organizations, I talk to the staff here all the time, I ask the question, does your physician remind you to come in for physicals? Yeah, I get something in the mail. I said, yeah, but do they call you? Do they try to proactively schedule the appointment? And I'm finding that at least for a lot of younger folks, the organizations aren't really pushing for the patients and trying to manage that. So what are the kind of metrics that we would want to look at around value-based care and patient access? As more and more value-based care becomes the main part of our reimbursement, it's really important to start looking at the wellness indicators and making sure we're being proactive and getting those in. Um, if we're looking at reducing costs, obviously outpatient versus inpatient trends is the biggest place to look right there. And then what we want to look at is kind of patient engagement. We want to be able to look at canceled appointments. Are we rescheduling those or are they just falling through the cracks? making sure that we're being a satisfactory partner with our referring providers. And then um, looking at patients that just haven't been in for the past two years or so, um, is there an opportunity for outreach in, in moving forward that way? But really trying to broaden that patient base is going to be key in, in working with these new quality-based reimbursement methodologies. So I have one Excel dashboard that's been built out. This is an example of something we've done here, and I know a number of clients are using either this template or similar things, but we're kind of showing a variety at the top here. We have some shared savings and understanding how many patients or even how much potential risk, financial risk there is in that type of a plan. On the left side of the screen, showing the top five or 10 quality metrics and how are we performing against those metrics or targets. 
looking at our scheduling volume opportunities and even some of then our major categories as an example of a a dashboard. And uh, certainly don't want to belittle the power that Excel can bring in putting dashboards together. If we move to a uh, sort of an interactive visualization, this one's fairly simple. We have the patient primary uh, number of patients by department or division that they are primarily seen by their uh, primary care physician. We also then have the providers broken down with the number of patients that are either past due for wellness visits or have never had a wellness visit. And so this kind of interactive dashboard makes it very easy to understand which physicians or care teams we have the most patients in. But if we blended out that wellness visit data with scheduling who's available for appointments, we can very quickly see who's past due for a a wellness visit and has no appointment and is not scheduled to come back in. And so very quickly, we can then start to see which physicians or even which patients we want to focus on and make sure we're taking advantage of that program, both for quality reasons, but also for financial reasons. I think one of the things you just did here as well, Russ, when you showed that their visit was overdue and they don't have an appointment scheduled, you just created a work list. Matter of seconds, that right there is a work list for an outreach team to try to get those appointments scheduled and uh, get those wellness visits taken care of because that's a great opportunity for organizations to better manage the care of their patients. Certainly makes it very easy. I was going to say, a lot of times our, our clients ask us, you know, what, where do we start? And we'll talk more about this in, a, in an upcoming webinar of, of where we go, of how do you build successful visual and, and how do you move forward with that? And obviously, you want to make sure you know your goals ahead of time and that you, you understand and you're getting the right data. Is it valid? Is it what we think we're measuring? And how, how can we best access that? Yeah, and as Scott mentioned, we're going to talk more about this. Um, we also have a white paper that we've just finished publishing um, on these four phases, but piloting data, working with real dashboards, making sure you're getting that data you pilot in front of users. And then, of course, then the back end and the tuning, whether we're going to use a high-end tool like Tableau or MicroStrategy to publish out dashboards for 100 or even 1,000 users or just trying to automate the back end. So we'll we'll talk more about that. We didn't talk a lot about this, but if you've worked with any of these data sets or you've tried to build any of these dashboards, you may have seen metrics even in our presentation where you say, where is that data coming from? Probably the biggest obstacle to building visualizations, not just for patient access, but is getting your hands on the right data. In particular, with patient access data, it's all time-based data. Doing calculations between lag times, days, and hours is not sort of straight math, say, versus typical revenue data. And then uh, we saw this in the polls, but aligning patient satisfaction data with scheduling data can be challenging. Integrating benchmarks and then even looking at denial causes, which if we don't have good front-end registration processes can can impact a lot of the different pieces of what we're doing. Yeah, at the end of the day, we can look at all the challenges. We can look at all of the initiatives and look at all of the different metrics that are out there. And we may show improvement, but... Really, it's very simple. Are we getting more patients in? Are we getting them faster? And are our utilization rates reasonable? Are we overworking our providers or are they where they need to be? The most important thing, again, as we've talked about numerous times, is we could be as successful as we want, but if our patients don't think we're doing a good job, we weren't successful. A provider that I once worked with gave me a great quote once where he said, Regardless of what we think, patient care isn't excellent unless the patient thinks it is. So really managing those patient perceptions is what's critical. And a lot of times that means we need to do a better job even than what our internal goals are in order to make sure we're doing the right thing for our patients. With that, thank you so much for attending. Stay safe, and uh, hopefully we'll hear from you or see you at an upcoming event. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody.